Where will we work now? The Future of Office, a Tangent Original Series. By now, odds are you've either worked from a co-working space, heard about them, or are listening from one right now. And today, over 3 million use co-working spaces worldwide. The way and where we work has changed forever. Remote, hybrid, flexible, it's a whole new world out there. Yet, face-to-face -face interaction is more needed than ever. In this new series, Jeffrey Berman, Zach Ahrens and Edward Cohen will explore the future of the workplace and how office spaces are being reshaped. We'll take you on a journey to understand how the very nature of office buildings is evolving. How did we get here? And where are we heading? Join us as we explore the modern office and how prop tech founders, real estate owners and operators, and VC investors are reimagining its role across cities. Because in real life and in office will always be where innovation meets collaboration. Hi, welcome to Tangent. I'm Edward Cohen. Hey there. Welcome to Tangent. I am Jeffrey Berman. Today on Tangent, we have Ryan Simonetti, CEO and co-founder at Convene and co-founder at East Capital. Ryan has been at the forefront of reshaping office real estate for over a decade, and he's led Convene to becoming the largest single provider of dedicated meeting and event venues across the US and the UK. Hi, Ryan. Where does this podcast find you? Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, actually, in New York today. Cold one here, though. Oh, I can empathize, but I'm in Florida, and it's... Oh, I'm jealous. Jeff is ready for winter, growing his hair back, ready for hibernation. Well, you know, I have to go back to New York fairly often, and I get sick every time I come back because the temperature change is so stark. I'm going back there next week for a few hours, and I asked my wife, I said, where is my... Because I, I haven't been wearing a coat up there because it's so hot down here. And now I'm like, where is my winter coat? I need to bundle up. I'm actually heading down to Miami tonight. My buddy is the CFO at Royal Caribbean and they're launching that new ship. I don't know if anyone's seen the icon, uh, icon of the seas. Uh, so uh, we're going down and doing the maiden voyage uh, tomorrow with the kids, which is going to be amazing. That's awesome. That sounds awesome. I think I did hear about it a lot because first it's the largest ship ever. What is it? Seven yep. seven thousand capacity or over? Yeah. And I also just went on a family cruise for the first time in forever, and um, I I wish you well. Uh, I wish you that you prepare. It sounds a diet like good luck, is what you're after. saying. After <laughs> I prepare a, a diet after it because you will uh, devour lots of delicious food uh, more than you'll ever see. You'll never feel hungry ever. Anyway, um, Ryan, you've been competing and thriving in a similar space to WeWork since two thousand nine. Um, with WeWork's recent bankruptcy, Tangent listeners would love to hear about how you see uh, WeWork's bankruptcy impacting the flex office space going forward, and and what are its implications for the industry? Yeah, and and first, you know, just for uh, for those tuning in, you know, Convene, you know, I think is really in a category of its own. Uh, you know, when we founded the business back uh, in two thousand and nine, so we've been doing this a long time. You know, the thesis was what if you ran an office building like a boutique kind of hospitality driven hotel? And so at our core, you know, we really are a hospitality company that designs and manages, um, you know, a premium network of meeting event uh, and flexible office spaces uh, around the world with, you know, obviously the US and the UK being our biggest market. So as, as much as we're in and around, I think, co-working and we works business. We 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 do view ourselves as being fundamentally you know different for lots of reasons. You know, with that said, uh, you know, obviously the WeWork bankruptcy is a is a is a seminal moment for I think the industry and the sector. Uh, you know, I posted on LinkedIn about this I think a few months ago when it was first announced. You know, this is as complicated of a restructuring that's maybe ever happened in the history of restructurings, uh, and not only. Is it the restructuring of WeWork, which ultimately I think will be healthy for them and healthy for the industry? But given the size and scale of WeWork's footprint in every building that they operate in, it requires the simultaneous restructuring of the underlying capital structure of every building, right? And so I think as, the, as WeWork is working its way through this process, the amount of complexity that not just they're dealing with, but that the actual asset owners and lenders of the assets underpinning those leases um, is equally complicated. And you know, I, I think sometimes companies go in and come out really quickly. I, 
I would not be surprised if this takes 12, 18, 24 months, if not longer, for them to work their way through this, just given what the impact is at the asset level and the capital structure of uh, of the asset level. But you know what's also interesting? This, let's call it momentary pain, is actually hastening something that I have been, we have been prognosticating for, for years, which is that the traditional office lease was typically five years or 10 years. And when someone was buying an office building, they were underwriting five to 10 year cash flow using Argus runs, basing their return on those terms. WeWork came in, and again, Regis already existed, but WeWork came in and with ludicrous speed started signing leases, longer term leases, but then re-letting their space on a month to month basis. What this collapse is, and then the, of course, the, the movement of work from home is hastening is a complete rethink on how office buildings are capitalized. Well, I would say it's definitely changing the cost of financing as well, right, Jeff? Oh, yeah, because too. as as income streams get shorter, right? And there's examples of this in other asset class as well, but as as typically as income streams get shorter, visibility becomes less. Oftentimes churn goes up or volatility goes up, which means technically risk premium should go up. And, you know, putting aside let's call it the general structural lack of liquidity within office as an asset class right now, and that's both equity capital as well as debt capital. Even in a normalized capital markets environment, the debt should probably cost a little bit more and the expectations of return on equity should probably be a little bit higher because by default, there's more risk in operating a building that way. Right. Um, and, and, you know, like Jeff, you and I have talked about this and, and we've, uh, you know, in a former life, I was uh, a structured finance guy and invested. Um, and this is something that we've been talking about, you know, for a long time as well. And I agree that it's, it's accelerating, I, I think, the speed of companies adopting outsourcing and kind of shorter duration consumption, which uh, obviously for a business like ours, selfishly speaking, is really good for us. Uh, at the same time, I also believe it's accelerating how the capital markets need to think about valuing and pricing the asset class. And it can't be done, to your point, because of what's happening in the way that it had been in the past. And whether it's a hybrid of how I would var- value a hotel and an office building and you kind of mash it together, unclear to me. But I do think there will be visibility coming out of this over the next 12 to 24 months. And the way that these buildings are valued, I believe, will fundamentally change. Uh, and the methodology in which they're valued, I believe, will fundamentally change coming out of this. Yep. I think you're right. Fascinating. I mean, yeah, the sheer scale, like you said, I think at what point, I don't know if still, but WeWork was the largest office tenant in London. And in consecutive quarters in New York City, they were largest, you know, leading leasing activity albeit it was inflated or or backed by uh, venture capital and, and other financing mechanisms that wasn't real tenants, if you will. Um, anyway, curious about, so Convene, you, you rised at the, you know, during the 2010s era, the era where VC and tech was ambitious and it was, there was abundant capital. How, how did you manage to avoid, quote unquote, the tech valuation trap and, and come out on the other side? Uh, you know, we've raised, I mean, when we first started back in uh, the company back in 2009, uh, unfortunately, uh, the the Jeffs and the Camber Creeks and the whole really, I would say, kind of early stage venture ecosystem didn't really exist within real estate as a sector. Um, honestly, real estate technology and software at the time was a little bit of, of kind of a dirty word. And historically, general as VCs hadn't really been that interested Hold in this. Hold on a second. What, what, you, what year are you talking? 2008 and, 2000 and early 2009. So we were raising in 2008. Um, and you know, I think at that time, generalists had historically kind of stayed away from the sector because it was always viewed as like smaller TAM, right? Finite market, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, thanks to Jeff and others, um, you know, it's a very different world today. And so we always you know, kind of had to I would say scrap out the way that we financed the business early on. And, um, you know, I think financed it uh, always more with like a family office or private equity bend than we did a venture bend. Uh, and also, um, you know, when I look at Convene as a business and also being uh, an LP and Camber's funds and others, and also having done a lot of early stage investing myself, the profile of Convene as a business, to me, I wouldn't call it a venture backable business. Um, it's an incredible business. 
Uh, it's a business that can have extreme scale and deliver great returns. But from a complexity uh, capital requirement standpoint, there's lots of nuances around like building a technology driven or enabled hospitality company that honestly to me doesn't set up well for that type of capital. Um, and so we've just always been, I think, a little bit more conservative. Uh, if you look at our cap structure, the types of partners that we brought in, including strategic landlord capital over time, I would just say just oriented us to a different type of a growth growth profile, uh, you know, a different type of valuation hurdle that we were ultimately always solving for. Uh, and I think it allowed us to grow probably more thoughtfully and disciplined because we didn't have the pressure of kind of chasing to the next hurdle, which um, you know, in in the venture world, you know, founders and management teams, you know, I think feel that pressure in a way that, you know, maybe we haven't felt that pressure. Yeah, I would I would definitely call that being self aware and also being a, a realist in terms of uh, the type of business and the space that you're operating in, and that shows with your you know with your investors like Aris and RXR and Hudson Bay Company. I think uh, that's uh, shows that you're you have aligned capital backing you. In the heart of Silicon Valley, there's an organization making waves in helping solve the housing crisis, Housing Trust Silicon Valley. At Housing Trust, they provide developer financing, homeownership assistance, and lender and broker resources to help create more equitable and affordable communities. Established over 20 years ago by local businesses, community leaders, and affordable housing activists, Housing Trust Silicon Valley uses transformative housing finance and public and private partnerships to create a strong, affordable housing market. From those experiencing homelessness to developers, renters, and first-time home buyers, Housing Trust SV is dedicated to ensuring that every neighbor has access to safe, stable, and affordable housing. Housing Trust SV is making a difference in the 14 counties of the Greater Bay Area and Sacramento. These are communities with a common need, more affordable housing and the capital to support its development. Join the Housing Trust SV in making a lasting impact on our communities. Housing Trust Silicon Valley, where innovation meets compassion. Learn more at housingtrustsv.org. In terms of the office market in 2024 and beyond, so let's set the stage because a recent office market report in the U.S. Uh, found that effective rent, uh, that the rent what tenant pays after incentives, uh, like free rent and concessions has declined 10% nationally since the first quarter of 2020. Uh, highest effective rent is in Manhattan with an average of just under $39 a foot, uh, which is a dip of 20% compared to three, four years ago. Um, LA has dipped 11%, San Francisco 31%. Miami, on the other hand, is up 21% to over $37 a foot. So that means there's only $2 per square foot difference between office in New York, in Manhattan, and office in Miami. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts. How do you see the different office markets performing in 2024 and beyond? Well, the first thing I'll, I'll say is, uh, and I'll put my uh, my economics major on, uh, supply and demand is a powerful thing. Uh, and at a both a macro and a micro level is what ultimately moves markets. And I think what we're seeing um, is really what is the new normal kind of post pandemic in uh, in this, let's call it permanent hybrid working world, right? We're now two years really removed from pandemic. Um, a lot of companies last year and into this year are making strategic real estate decisions now based on what they know about the way they and their employees and clients are going to utilize space. Uh, and you know, I've said for a long time, half the space, twice the experience. Um, and I think we're seeing and feeling uh, that for the most part, there's less demand for office. When a customer is up for renewing its lease, which by the way, we should keep an eye on this because there's a lot of big renewals that need to happen or are coming up like lease maturities over the next few years. Most of those companies, I think, realize and acknowledge that they need less space, but the space that they need needs to be different and it needs to do more for them. Uh, it needs to be more experiential. It needs to support uh, experience and collaboration in a different way. Uh, it needs to be a beacon and carrier of corporate culture. It needs to be more of a gathering space or a convening space than a workspace. 
And that is playing itself out globally in every city in a different way, right? Uh, you know, if I even look at what's happening in New York versus LA is different, what's happening in London versus New York is different. And that's driven by two things. One, uh, natural supply and demand and constraints around that, uh, meaning aggregate supply and also what supply exists in the market. Like the flight to experience and quality is a real thing. We know class A trophy is outperforming, if not performing better than it ever has in the past. So there's a little bit of a have and have not within class A versus everything else. And each market candidly has different quantities of class A versus B versus C, right? And so that's factoring into supply and demand. And then the second thing is each market from a return to office standpoint has behaved a little bit differently, right? You know, certain industries and certain sectors have tended to be more in office as opposed to less in office. And based on those markets and the industry makeup, you're seeing technically different both utilization, but also demand pattern. And it's going to take some time over the next couple of years. Um, but I think you're going to continue to see uh, companies, generally speaking, take less, outsource more to companies like us. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on, let's call it non-class A experiential office for the foreseeable future until we get to some new equilibrium of supply and demand, which means uh, it's going to be a lot of buildings that aren't office buildings anymore when the dust settles. Absolutely. And, and another, I think, factor that, that we're seeing now is that leverage seems to be on the on the tenant or the occupier side. Uh, so interesting to see how that will play out and where do we find equilibrium if we find uh, we're for class B or class C office spaces? But then I want to talk about like our business, right? So, you know, if you think about the flight to quality, just like what's happening in office, the same thing is happening within the flex sector. If I look at our performance right now, even against 2019, um, our same store, uh, if I look at kind of Q4 heading into this year, we're going to outperform what we did in, uh, in 2019, most likely. We've seen... Uh, what, 15% year-over-year growth in meeting and event revenue last year. Well, We're assuming double-digit growth again this year. Our workplace product right now, which isn't co-working, it's really built and geared for you know, kind of teams between eight and 30 that don't want to do a landlord spec suite um, and want to be in, like call it a full service hospitality driven environment like Convene, our workplace product is 92% occupied. We've got multiple locations at 100% with a wait list. Uh, and we're actually increasing pricing, not decreasing pricing. So if I think about our net effective, our numbers are going up, not down. And I think the same thing is happening within class A office the same way. So it's this, I would say, tale of two cities, this have and have not. And we as a brand are 100% getting the benefit of flight to quality, flight to premium, flight to experience, uh, even within the flex sector. You briefly mentioned this uh, transition from property management to experience management and you know, considering the emphasis on, on collaboration, on employee well-being. Uh, curious, what innovative features could be integrated into uh, future office environments? Uh, well, one, you know, I believe uh, that we're starting to head into a world where tenant or employee starts to need to feel like member, like member of the building. Um, and when you think about what it means to be a member of something, there's a different intentionality and feeling of what it means to be a member. There's something special about that. There's something personal about that. The second thing as part of that is building becomes brand, right? And so if you start to think about like employee or tenant as member building as brand, the next layer to that would be, well, really, well, what runs that building? Well, it should be a hospitality management company with a flag and distribution. And I'm starting to see a world where office, not just our sector, but office more broadly speaking, should start to look and feel like the hospitality industry where like the brand means something. Me, I'm like a member, a loyalty part of that brand. And then that brand gives me access to things both within my building and outside of my building vis-a-vis -a, -vis a network. And so we as a business have for some time and continue to think about, well, what does that mean for us and how can we help support landlord in executing that? And the fastest growing part of our business right now is white labeled, independently branded experiences where not only are we running the amenities in the building, 
we're running the entire front of house in the building. Meaning when you walk into the lobby and get greeted at reception, it's a convene employee, not a CBRE or JLL employee or an employee of the operator that owns their property management business. So this whole idea of experience management and property management coming together, like front of house, back of house. So that to me is like, that is happening. Um, And I think there's a huge opportunity for platforms like us to partner strategically with some of the legacy property management companies to help bridge that divide. That is also going to hasten the flight to quality because what you're describing is an expense driver for office owners and managers. And I know this because we have a number of LPs that have that have been embracing experiences for their tenants for decades. And their cost basis, their expenses were always higher than the no frills landlord. And so it's becoming like like you're saying, almost table stakes that people are feeling like they need some community, not just within their employment base, not just within their company, but if I'm going to leave the comforts of my home, I want to be able to have an experience that feels homey, that feels like a club. And that what that translates to? Money. That translates to cost that's not necessarily recouped, but it is amazing. You said something earlier that really shouldn't be overlooked, which is that you're raising prices. And I think that the reason you're able to do that is that people are saying it's worth paying a little bit more for an experience that feels wonderful that takes me from a uh to this aspirational place where I'm at the Four Seasons or I'm at the St. Regis or I'm at Convene and I feel welcome here. I feel coddled here. So and and, and yeah. if you think about it though, the math from the tenant's perspective too, well if I if the landlord's gonna deliver these amenities and experiences, which historically I had to deliver for myself. Like most people don't realize this, but <clears throat> most big companies like Fortune 1000, almost 20% of their real estate is allocated to meeting event and training space, food service space, like cafeterias, cafes, wellness, healthcare, mobility spaces, like literally internal touchdown spaces, like running their own co-working spaces. Guess what? Those spaces, because I know, are the most expensive to build. They require the most ongoing CapEx. They have the most ongoing technology need, which we all know technology changes and you got to replace stuff usually pretty quickly. And from a labor perspective, very expensive to staff and operate. And so if you think about if if that infrastructure is moving to someone like convene and landlord, well, me as a tenant, I now have to spend less of my own CapEx. I can take less real estate. I don't have to staff all the SGA and 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 manage the operating cost structure to manage it. And I get a better experience. You know what? I'm happy to pay a premium to outsource that when I need it. And so you're seeing this like rotation of I'm taking less space, I'm getting rid of the expensive stuff. Well, I'm happy to pay a premium to use a convene when I need it. Like And so it it makes sense why the tenant would be willing to pay a premium both in rent, but also to pay for the services because there is an ROI on the opposite side of it. And not just an ROI in a better experience, but also an ROI in that they just saved a ton of money too. Absolutely. I think, and that's, that's the way you, you attract and also retain top talent, uh, in today's world. Um, and it really goes back to what uh, Jeff said as well. It's, it's community, it's belonging. It's uh, it's it's the most human thing ever, right? We we want to feel that we we belong and that we we are we are a place that we are enabled and, to, to and, thrive. And Edward, that right there is exactly why there's a need, and there will always be a place for an office. There will always be a place for a convening space because we are social creatures. Uh, innately, we want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. I think that's like a innate part of being a human being. Uh, and so to me, there's always going to be demand. The question now is, well, well, what is that mean? Like, what is that experience? How many square feet? What is my office? When do I go? When do I not go? And I think that's what we're starting to see, that there's starting to become a pattern around how companies are defining that strategy for themselves. So as tough as it is in office, there's still an opportunity here because the need uh, isn't going away. And as a CEO, I can tell you, especially running a bigger company, it is impossible to run a business 100% on Zoom and Slack. It's just not possible. Um, Can you do a lot of things on there? Are they great productivity tools? Does it allow you flexibility? Yes. But you like strategic work, collaboration, like 
the stuff that really moves the needle, creating culture, building trust with your team members, it, it Unless technology continues to advance, which it could, like the face to face, breaking bread, getting on the whiteboard together, like that's just not replaced yet. Might be, but not yet. I'm sure Jeff's invested in something that's going to replace it, but not yet. We're just going to have a bunch of robots hanging out with us at home. That's going to replace it. That's um, the future. Uh, in terms of leveraging in person and telepresence in the hybrid era, uh, what role might virtual or augmented reality play in redefining the concept of a physical office presence? Look, there's, um, and we've done some research here, there's some really interesting technology and advancements that are being made in the whole VR and augmented space. And that there is, there's no question in my mind that over the next five to 10 years, we'll see more and more of that integrated into. We're at least a decade away, at least. I, I, and Jeff might say, I think five to 10, but maybe it's 10 to 20. Here's why. Uh, anything that is a cumbersome, frictionful experience. No one's going to do it. it exactly. <laughs> and, and like putting on glasses, which is why I'm excited. I don't know. I, have you tried the Apple Vision? I haven't tried the Apple Vision yet. No. So if that feels natural, which I feel like it won't, the, the, the moment that you can have, you ever see the movie Disclosure? Yep. That was, you, you remember that? You remember, like that, and that was way ahead of its time. That's like, what, yeah. 30 years ago or something? <laughs> Where you had these like poles and they turned on and all of a sudden you were you were essentially in in the office in a digital holographic way that will be an absolute game changer when we can feel the energy of each other and be remote and that will change that will that will that will further erode this idea of an office versus like what convene is i would call convene like almost a what convene and, and convene like companies is almost like a third place because yep. more than just an office, right? Like I've been to the convenes and it's like a nice place to meet somebody, right? Like yep. I'd rather go there than a Starbucks. Yeah. So, but but with VR, I certainly think like I'm looking forward to the day I, and I'll probably be a grandfather by then when it's frictionless and I could just zap in and, be, and, and see my entire team. But I think we're a ways away I, from that. I, the thing that's interesting for us is the the hologram where I, I can bring speakers in in a way that feels different physically, like especially now, especially in the meeting and event world, like, and we're seeing this, like every meeting and event we host, there's some sort of virtual speaker or a virtual attendee now. Like it's almost by default, every meeting that convene does, it has some hybrid element to it by default. Um, and so that's an area where we see something interesting. And then I think secondly, in the meeting and event world, how do you create for the virtual and attendee an experience that feels more integrated? And I do think that there's a place for some of these newer technologies to improve the experience for a virtual participant in a way that um, makes you feel connected, either to the actual event that's happening or even to the virtual audience that you're kind of watching with. Um, and so there's some interesting stuff that some of the platforms are, are thinking about there. But I think before any of that happens, honestly, like we have to figure out how to better integrate virtual into the office. Um, you know, We just installed uh, Zoom's new system, like Zoom rooms in our office, where we're trying to just like, even now, like our people still work remote a lot of days, even though we're in office, like every meeting we take, some people are in the room, some people are online. The technology just to make that seamless and frictionless still isn't 100% there. So before we can do anything crazy, we got to get the basics done and somebody has to figure out um, how to make hybrid in office a better experience um, and have the technology work consistently. Like even, I can't tell you how many times I go in these rooms and for whatever reason, like the camera's not working or you can't log in. It's just, there's so much friction still in that experience that, you know, uh, hopefully uh, you can get sorted out over the next few years. I mean, I have even lower expectations. I just want to start meetings with someone not being on mute, uh, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there soon enough. Um, now, Ryan, your new venture, let's move on because there's some exciting stuff happening in the, in the private credit and the lending world uh, as banks have been pulling back and recalibrating their, their real estate strategies. Uh, you launched a tech-driven la lender, uh, Ease Capital, uh, to provide uh, the simplest way to finance multifamily. Um, so tell us, what's your strategy there? Uh, what are you thinking? And why is this uh, a good time to enter private credit? Yep. So first, uh, as you can tell, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really, my career grew up in the real estate finance business. I started at Lehman Brothers Structured Credit, uh, went to a, a finance 
company called Gramercy Capital, which ultimately became uh, a public company. And uh, my wife has stayed in real estate finance uh, and is co-running a real estate credit business for a large alternative asset manager. So uh, specialty finance, real estate lending, real estate finance capital is something that's obviously uh, near and dear to my heart. And I always wanted to get back into it, but do it a different way and do it with, you know, I would say as an entrepreneur. Um, and so during COVID, when my wife and I were working together, uh, I was shocked that the way that she went about sourcing deal flow, the way that she went about underwriting, the process, the workflows, nothing had changed since I was doing it in 2008 and 2009. Yet every other finance vertical, consumer finance, resi finance had changed dramatically. And so the idea was, <clears throat> well, if you could apply data and technology in a smart way, could you source more efficiently? Uh, could you underwrite and price risk more uh, uh, efficiently? Um, and in doing that, you know, to some extent, build a better mousetrap. So I uh, came up with the idea um, along with uh, my two co-founders who uh, were co-founders at Reonomy, uh, the real estate data company, uh, to launch Ease Capital, which is a technology-driven multifamily uh, lender and asset manager. Um, we exclusively focus on multifamily. Uh, multifamily is the largest asset class. Uh, and we're focused on a very specific segment of the market, which is like the lower mid market. So five million to thirty-five million dollar loans. Uh, most people don't realize, but ninety-seven percent of every multifamily loan that's closed each year is under thirty-five million dollars, uh, and it represents more than fifty percent of the aggregate multifamily lending, which you know is four hundred billion, give or take, a year. So huge TAM, very very fragmented, uh, and historically has been dominated by regional banks. Um, and so you can imagine with what's going on, regulation, uh, consolidation, and a lack of liquidity in the regional banking market, we felt that the market was going to shift towards private credit. But that Blackstone, KKR, Carlisle, New York Life, now all the big asset managers would never want to build the capability to do small loans. They like to do big loans. So if we could build the platform, we would then be able to go attract these big institutional sources of capital and bring that capital down to what we would call kind of the lower mid-market of multifamily. Uh, and so uh, we started the company about two years ago, uh, spent about 18 months in stealth uh, building the team and the technology. Uh, and we recently announced publicly uh, through our first kind of fund or vehicle, uh, which was a $450 million partnership with Taconic Capital Advisors, uh, a, a New York-based asset manager. Uh, and yeah, we're, uh, we're out actively providing uh, owners and operators of multifamily real estate um, flexible financing solutions uh, to help them execute their business plans at a time where uh, it's really tough to raise money. Fascinating. Timing is of the essence here. Um, Ryan, collaboration superpower. If you could choose one person, historic or living, to do a partnership with, to collaborate with, who would it be? Uh, I'm a big sports guy. And growing up as a kid, like many of my generation, because I'm a washed up millennium 42, uh, <laughs> it would be something with Michael Jordan. And I have no idea what, but it would be something. Maybe kind of partner with him on one of the new golf courses that he's building and like build like a golf destination convene S retreat, but with Michael Jordan. I think that'd be pretty damn cool. I think he bets $1 million per hole. Is that... Is that what he, I read so he has, he has a private club here called The Grove. The Grove, yep. And a friend of mine is a member. And I've been begging him to take me golfing and he just, he won't. And, he's, and he, he plays with Jordan. But Jordan, in order to join you, one, you have to know him. Two, yep. you have to be either an incredible golfer or an inveterate gambler. And, that's it. That's the, that's the pass the test. The litmus and test. It's, and it's usually both. And the... Like, uh, They, and I heard you have to drink tequila and like cigars too. I heard that's a prerequisite. Yeah, uh, cigars are less important. I've but heard tequila is important. Uh, I've heard. I have not heard about <laughs> the drinking, but the gambling is an absolute must. Wild. So there we go, Edward. That would be it. Jeff, maybe we have something. Start with the tequila and the cigars. Maybe you have a chance. But uh, Jeff, you can start with uh, Rory McIlroy's pottery uh, in the mini golf. Maybe you'll. Yeah, I like. I like golf. I'm not very good at it, but I like it. Well, living down in Florida now, you got to pick that up. It's that in yeah. tennis for you. Pickleball. Um, Brian, where can Tangent listeners uh, connect with you and learn more about Convene and East Capital? Uh, 
LinkedIn, obviously a great spot to hunt me down and I do my best to respond to everyone that reaches out. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at RW Simonetti uh, as well. And then convene.com and easecapital.io are two great places to to keep up on all the exciting things that you know, our teams and, uh, and businesses are doing. Ryan Simonetti, CEO and co-founder at Convene. Thank you so much for coming to Tangent today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, yep, it was. Awesome. Thank great you, gentlemen. You. I appreciate it. Good to see you too, sir. Take care. All right. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening to Where Will We Work Now? The Future of Office, a Tangent original series. Don't forget to follow, rate and review us and share the show with a friend. This series is produced by Edward Cohen. If you'd like your company or organisation to be featured across Tangent's community, you can email us at tangentcommunity at gmail.com. And remember, collaboration is our superpower. So stay curious and always be learning.